Hello, good afternoon. We are, well, very happy to, to meet you all here this afternoon for a, an interesting discussion about subgenres of memoir. Um, memoir being essentially another word, a fancy word for autobiography or uh, comics about you, that you write about your own experience and your own life. And uh, uh, a brief intro to uh, situate who we have on the panel, first of all. Uh, we have Kayla E. Um, we, who is the author of Precious Rubbish, a book, a, a small press zine, a uh, beautiful comic, but also coming out as a full color graphic novel from Fantagraphics in 25. So just you know, don't hold your breath, because it's quite a long time, but still, <laughs> it, I've seen it already, it's wonderful. Eddie Campbell, uh, Eddie and I go back eons, practically, to the, to the 80s, before some of you were even born, I expect. Sorry, shouldn't say that. Uh, and Eddie has a brand new graphic novel, autobiographical memoir out. And here we have uh, Elizabeth Trembley, who is published by uh, Street Noise, with her uh, graphic novel uh, telling us the same uh, shocking event, but from various multiple variations of, of the narrative of her memories, and showing also sometimes how fickle and unreliable our memories can be. And at the end, we have Mari Naomi, uh, who is the, the author of Turning Japanese, and also the brand new book, I Didn't Know You Loved Me. Is that I like thought you loved me. I thought you loved me. Sorry, it's not all in my head here. I, I <laughs> thought you loved me. Uh, is that actually, by the way, is there a song called that already, or is it? Uh, I, not I, that I know of. There is one no. called Turning Japanese, though. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. So you're waiting for the, for your, for the song to come Someone out. Someone should write a song about my book. <laughs> <laughs> now, these authors, all four of them, have done important stuff with autobiography. Uh, it's, not, it's a genre we take for granted now. I mean, it's a very, not just take for granted, it's a very important, big genre. Just go down to the... The, the, the hall downstairs, or upstairs, I should say, all the, uh, the publishers, there are many of them, of course. And it's taken for granted now that you can do this in comics, but for many, many years, it was really not possible. Um, and on Friday, uh, there was the world premiere of the movie Married to Comics, a documentary about, not just about Justin Green, who is really seen to be the kind of founding father of Autobio during the underground comics era of, back in 1972, but also of his wife, and now sadly his widow, Carol Tyler, who is doing some of the most astonishingly beautiful uh, memoir comics around. And so this is, we're looking here at a generational continuation. Basically, this is this, there's people that, have, that are still adding to this incredible genre. And uh, it's really good to look back and realize where you've come from and look to see where the medium is going to in the future. Um, OK, a brief, a very brief intro. I won't hog all this conversation, but uh, we have a bit of time, hopefully. But I'm just rather excited about my new book, which has come out here, which is a, a bio, uh, it's a monograph, a monograph about Tove Janssen, not as I once heard on a trailer for a Moomin film, and now the new film from Tove Janssen. <laughs> uh, sorry, it's Tove Janssen. And uh, this is my most recent book. It's gone into 12 languages, which is wow. quite wonderful, including Finnish. And next weekend, I'm at the Helsinki Comics Festival to, to celebrate that. And also, we're going to actually put up a little metal plaque next to her favorite table in her favorite restaurant. Um, and that, that bookings to that table, of course, will then be booked until, who knows, 10 years or something, because they will almost sit where she sat. But uh, that's going to be really special. And briefly, if you're in Paris, as I know, Kayla, you're going to be, um, then literally on the 28th of September, a beautiful, interesting show of Tova's work is going to be in, in, on show on, in a five-story former embassy building, uh, or residence, actually, so very, very she-she. And each floor will be looking at a different era and aspect of Toby Janssen's extraordinary career. So there we go. Um, let me just, I'm operating this thing as well at the same time. <laughs> let me see what we, we have. What we have here is, is uh, a proposed running order, but actually, which is the order of the images. And I, but we can, I'm hoping, as well as spotlighting each of the four of you, that you will be able to branch out from each of your work into questions and themes that you have in common, or how you've approached certain things to, to memoir, and how you see the genre more, more broadly, beyond just perhaps your, your, your own immediate practice. So, which one? I can go press the button. Oh, it does work. There we are. So, um, let me start with Kayla. I've, uh, and uh, Kayla, you very kindly sent me some of your small press publications, your self-published books. Yes, but that's right. As you rightly pointed out in your email to me, you said um, it's worth seeing it when they're in colour, which is how they're going to appear in the 
Um, so I think I have an image here, in fact. Oh, that's the bottom book. We'll come to that in a moment. But this is the, the little end paper section from, from the book, which not only gives a fascinating little biography and a lovely, charming photograph Aww, of you. thank you. And adorable. <laughs> but on the right, very interestingly, a lot of references. Perhaps you'd explain what these footnotes are, are about. Yeah, certainly. So my work uh, is heavily referential. I am really interested in mid-century children's comics, both as a fan uh, and as someone who is like just critical of that time period um, and the creators and the content. Uh, so I have like kind of a, mostly, it's, it's a love relationship, but also I feel entitled to take ownership over this work because when I read these mid-century comics as a child, they definitely played a huge role in my development of uh, understanding womanhood, femininity, the role that girls play, the type of childhood that I thought I was supposed to have. And so in my current body of work, I take mid-century children's comics and I just co-opt them and use them as a vehicle to tell stories of my extremely abusive childhood. Um, so just content warning, trigger warning, uh, my work has themes of incest, violence, uh, alcoholism. Um, I just had like a really wretched childhood. So every bad thing that could happen to a kid happened to me and appears in my work. Uh, so I, I use these comics as a framework to tell these stories of an actual childhood um, of a lesbian Mexican girl in poverty who grew up in a trailer and had dangerous parents. Um, so yeah, I, I really only tell these stories using that as a framework. I think the word framework is, is, is appropriate, but also, of course, there is a, an irony because these children's comics are usually set in a kind of blissful... Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, family's environment, which yeah. is that's something that you didn't get. So yeah, that's right. you were seeing the promise, I guess, in these comics that didn't the reality did not live up to. Yes, that's right. It was devastating. Yeah. <laughs> it was really yeah, devastating. Because yeah. I would be I remember like my dad never washed my sheets in our bed, so I never had clean sheets. And I would sit in my little twin bed and I would be reading Archie comics and I would be just like seeing these kids in Riverdale High with their like Veronica looking so hot with her tiny waist and her beautiful clothes and these like fashion splash pages and like everything was so clean and like orderly and beautiful. And in theory, typical. Tip exactly, in theory, <laughs> typical. And what, like, yeah. oh, that's what, that's what life is supposed to look like. And yeah. it just was like, when that dawned on me, I was around 10 years old and it just like really, there was a shift in my psyche and in my understanding of myself that was really not positive, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, what's clever and the way you bring your work together is you're using a lot of the, not just citing the, the images, but actually using the, the formats. Yes. Um, the various formats. You mentioned pinups, but other kinds of formats in these children's mm -hmm. comics, uh, which you can recognize, uh, mm -hmm. but then you repurpose them. Of yes, course. yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in some cases, in a lot of cases, I'm like redrawing panel for panel, but I, I remove all of the recognizable characters yeah. and I put my family characters in place or sometimes, uh, usually only my biological father I'll represent as some sort of like typical villain, like a big, big bad wolf or like mm. something like that. Um, mm. But he's the only character that ever takes a form that isn't like the human version. Um, right. Yeah, and all the characters except for my self-portrait character has their face shrouded throughout the entirety of my work. You never, I've never even drawn the full faces of my abusers. Uh, so it like, it, it, it allows me to uh, center my child self in telling of this story. Um, right, yeah. right. There, there are other things going on there too, I imagine. I mean, uh, I'm always struck by the fact that Chris Ware, until perhaps building stories, very often didn't show uh, full faces, yes, often, that's right, yeah. and often the most emotional moments were where his head was heads were turned away, or mm -hmm. you. And in, in many ways, what you don't see, you then imagine. You're yes. inviting the reader to that's right to, to draw the faces. Yes, the and to yeah. project their own stories yeah. onto the work. That's and right. I mean, a lot of my reader, my readership is uh, composed of other survivors of child abuse, and so I mm. think that like having also like my self portrait character is sort of a a, a blank face. Like her facial expression, expression never changes. She's like really weird looking, but rather generic. Uh, and, and in shrouding the real like appearance of my biological family, I'm like trying to create space for my readers to be able to make sense of their own childhoods. Exactly. We're seeing some of the formats here. You've got, of course, the, the, the paper doll approach, yes, yeah. which again promises 
uh, such an idyllic kind of life. And here, these, this is a charming spread where, perhaps you could explain a bit about this one. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so, so this is a spread where um, my biological mother just kind of uh, uh, loaded me down with all of our family ephemera. Uh, so I've been the caretaker of all of my family photos and like little letters and cards and whatever for my, like just basically forever actually. Uh, big heavy boxes of just like darkness. Which and you I, could say at the same time are an extraordinary resource. It's, they are, yeah, yeah, they, yeah they are, yeah. they are. Um, they're currently in my basement. Um, but in them I found these letters that my biological mother had kept that I would write her. Every weekend my biological father would, they were divorced. So I would go see my father, I would spend the weekend with him, and my mother has a personality disorder um, where she sort of wired my child brain to feel completely responsible for her well-being. So little me, fucking what, like six years old, seven years old, I'm like writing these notes, like desperate notes, like, hey ma, I just hope you know I love you, I'm so sorry I'm leaving, I'm gonna miss you, like, I made you a salad, I did the laundry, call me if you need me. And so these are the, ex like, these are the letters that I wrote my biological mother and would leave like with some kind of gift for her because I was absolutely terrified that she was gonna be mad at me about something, mm -hmm. that like I did something wrong. Um, and so even in spending time with the villain who was my biological father at the time, uh, I felt very scared. I could uh, that really. There is a, a tremendously powerful atmosphere to the, this book. I mean, oh, it really, really? It, it could it could not have. I think because you you are so you feel so empathetic towards your what you're going through. Thank and you. At the same time, though, there's this weird dissonance where, where of course, there's the, the bright colours which you've mm -hmm. chosen here, the the kind of cartoony jolliness of the whole thing. It, it really you're deliberately undercutting mm -hmm. how it looks, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm yeah. also really interested in uh, pulling readers in because the yeah. content is really difficult. Right. And uh, I'm a designer, I also work as creative director of Fanographics, and uh -huh. like, so I know how to build compelling images, and so right. I'm definitely am using that as a tool to try to draw people in to like sit with this work, because it's very, very difficult material. Exactly. And if I drew it the way it actually looked, I don't know if anyone would pick up my book. Exactly, well, and so that on the one hand, you could say that if you drew it as it looked, but also, I mean, drawing does allow us to look at things that we couldn't look at in absolutely. some other form. That's absolutely certainly right. Photographically, we couldn't. Absolutely As a right. documentary. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's, that's definitely part of it. Uh, and then you use the composition, the page is very, the, the book is very um, creatively curated and composed because you've got, it isn't linear, you have different formats, different time periods, mm -hmm. uh, that, but, but you piece, the, piece it together as you go through. Yeah. How have you, just briefly, how have you structured these? I know you're doing a lot of self-published individual comics, mm -hmm. uh, zines and things, but do you have an overview, a plan, or is, are, the th are things slotting in to, to, uh, to a picture, an overall Gestalt, do you want yeah, to make? It's, it's a really good question because yeah. I think that my process is really unorthodox. Yeah. Uh, I actually, this is a collection of work that I've been developing uh, basically underground for about 10 years. So mm. I'm in my 30s now and I'm publishing a book, but this is basically my debut as a cartoonist publicly. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was making this work. I, um, I'm sober now, so I was in active addiction when I first began the content in here. And I and was I still. I think we can fully um, empathize with the fact right. that you would resort to. Yeah, <laughs> right. Some yeah. kind of State. Yeah, yes. no, probably yeah. nobody blames me, but at the yeah. time I was uh, still in, in direct contact with my biological family. I was mm. lit. I moved back to Texas after I graduated from college uh, to care for my biological mother. Um, and so I was making this work in active addiction, caretaking for my bio mom, spending time with my dad, and my just like in the world of my abusers. And something was compelling me to make these comics. And honestly, I can't tell you what it was or why. Mm. I, I, I mm. was not in any position to promote myself. I couldn't share this work with the world. It was absolutely inappropriate, yeah. <laughs> you know? So well, um, I presume you had to make the work in, in secrecy. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, mm. my parents are narcissists though, so that's actually like one good thing is they're not Googling me. <laughs> no. They have no, they don't even know what I majored in. My mom thought that Harvard was in New York City. So like, she mm. just doesn't know, they don't, Really they couldn't detached. tell you my major, so I don't think that like, they luckily weren't looking even if, but I just didn't feel like I wanted to have work that I wasn't ready to talk about out mm. in the world. Um, mm. So I just kept developing my practice and like working as a cartoonist. 
uh, advocating for the cartoonists. Uh, I mostly worked as a publisher for an art and lit magazine, just oh, like, wow. yeah, like really like focusing on other people's work while I kind of quietly was building this. So mm -hmm. it's sort of this disparate collection of this body of work that uh, when I knew it was ready, I had like five years of sobriety. I felt like I was going no contact with my family. I was in therapy. And so I pitched the book to Fantagraphics when I was mm -hmm. finally ready. And I had the majority of it already made. Mm -hmm. So the past couple of years have just been me refining it, rewriting it, creating a ton of new material mm -hmm. to just, I, I don't even, it just like, when, it just like feels right. Like I know when it's done, when it mm -hmm. like, I don't, I believe in God. So it's like, I feel like God like just kind of tells me, she's like, you're good. And so it makes sense to me then, uh, and I can sort of like close it and let it go. So the book is completely finished. It's mm, just sitting mm, mm. there, ready to go to the printer, like totally done. But I, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for another year. And you, you probably mentioned, mentioned your faith, but actually, as, as you see on the screen here, I mean, the, the, there are these other spreads come through, which I think I'm not quite sure exactly what they're referencing. They obviously are. Mm -hmm. um, typ typographically, they're referencing things too. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes. I'm sure, uh, you know, for Chris Ware fans, you can definitely see the typographic influence there. Sure. Um, but uh, I collect comic cards. Uh, that's actually where my palette comes from. Uh, they're like these like gag cards that are, like, are made like on what looks like fake wood. They have like really like funny, but also like pretty offensive jokes. But the palette <laughs> is there's no black. Uh -huh. It's only like they use blue as the main line work, whoever this collection of artists were. Uh, and I've just been, I collect a lot of vintage stuff and I just really what, love. Era, what era are these from? These they're, I think they're like 50s, 60s. Okay. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so that's where like this sort of aesthetic of uh, at least the color palette came from. It's yeah. pulling directly from that. Um, uh -huh. And so the comic cards also have like a lot of gags and jokes. Uh, and some of like, particularly this piece, I think came from some like, gag thing I got at a thrift store. I don't remember, but it just like really resonated with me. I think it's like quite beautiful. It is. It's, it's a whole other level also, also of your story because you actually cite passages from the Bible. Absolutely, and heavily. The, the church aspect of it. And this complicates it even more because there is such, such a dark side to, the, to, the, to, the, to the, your parental relationship. Um, but then they are also involved with the church in various ways. Or, Absolutely, so they are, it, yeah. It makes yeah. the whole um, other mixture. Um, yeah, I think we, let me just see before else we have it. I mean, there you, 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 do, you do board game format. I mean, this is a mm. superbly free <laughs> format where comics are in there, but there are so many other kinds of uh, graphic approaches that you're using to bring across your experiences. And this is a tough read, I must say. I mean, it, uh, and it's a very powerful one and a very brave one, I Aww, think. Because um, I don't know really, uh, this is a subject that's clearly needs to be dealt with, but doesn't seem to have been touched on so much in comics that I'm aware of. It's extremely yeah. painful content yeah. to write. Yeah. Now, this is the thing we will come up, I think, in different degrees with the, with the, with the panelists, but uh, for you, has it been something helpful in the end to, to make this? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, in the end, yes, Oops, sorry. Uh, but in process, no. Yeah. Uh, I, I was talking to a fellow cartoonist who's a, a survivor of child abuse, and we were like talking about how like, like I don't make this work unless I'm already triggered. Like if like, I'm just, you know, um, and then I'm like, okay, well like the gate is open, so I guess I'll walk in and like start mm. making this work that is going to ruin a period of my life. Mm. I, I have horrific flashbacks, nightmares, panic attacks. When I make this work, uh, it requires like a lot out of me. Uh, so I won't do it if I'm already like in a vulnerable state because like I'm actually generally a very like happy person. I like my life. It's like really cozy. Uh, so I don't willingly invite this in. Um, so you had to have a distance from it and also had to have, have to be in the right place to even make. The Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I can see that. Yeah. Thank you so much. So yeah, that, thank this, you. This is coming thoughtful out. questions. So it's, it's Precious Rubbish, which of course itself is a wonderful title because, okay, comics are thought of as rubbish, uh -huh. but also I suspect it's a reference to yourself. Yeah it's, yeah, it's also a reference to T.L. Shaw, who uh, wrote this little book called Precious Rubbish, I think okay. in like the 50s, oh. where he has like, um, he's just like a, a absolutely loony, amazing writer who I love, but uh, he writes a lot of critique about the fine art world uh, and sort of like poking fun at the establishment oh. and like uh, pulling, like he has a real interest in sort of like lowbrow uh, like kind of trash material. So right. he was, a, I he's an author that I love and I thought that title was really compelling. Uh, and it also fits the body of work, like I think really beautifully. And it's like so hard to say, and I, 
<laughs> they're precious. You know, Absolutely. it's like I think that's really interesting. As yeah. like that's the entry point into my work is right. this like wall mm. of sound that like is very difficult to pronounce. Yeah, uh, and I just found that really compelling. It fits with, with with your whole goal, doesn't it? Very much. Thank you so much, Kayla. So let Thank me. You. Um, any reactions from you, I would love to hear. And I know you, you may not be familiar with the work fully or... But, it's uh, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Right, Thank okay, that'd be nice. I can't <laughs> wait to read it. Yeah, well, I could ask why, is, is there a reason, was it pandemic that delayed it from 24 to 25? No, my yeah. mental health. <laughs> Really, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. We shouldn't laugh. I'm sorry. About that. No, it's yeah. good. It was a good. It was a really, really good move. Uh, uh -huh. So it was going to come out this February, and uh, I would February of next year of 2024. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this month, uh, in talking to Jack at Fanographics, like we were like, oh, like publicity would start in September, mm. and like just dog man, I can't. I just, mm. I just cannot right now. It. It's just, it's gonna be nonstop when I start. And like sure. telling this story publicly is a huge deal. Mm. I mean, like, I don't have family. Like, I went completely no contact with my entire mm. biological family. And now mm. here I am, like, calling out my abusers and like telling all their secrets. Uh, and talking about the work is like actually like very triggering for me. Um, I've limited myself to two cons this year, two cons mm -hmm. next year, mm -hmm. and then when the book comes out, it's going to be nonstop. I'm not saying no to anything because mm -hmm. I need people to read this book. Uh, so I had to give myself space. Uh, I, I I'm not think I, outside of today, like this weekend. I don't think about this work. I sew. I hang out with my wife. She gardens. We like work on the house. Like right. I'm picking house colors. Like I don't think I can't think about this stuff. So I just needed mm -hmm. a break. Yeah, then it will be full on. I yeah, it will that. be. Yeah, I'm going to hustle. Comes. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, we'll we'll come back to you. And let me uh, jump next to, um, to Elizabeth Trembley. Mm -hmm. And this is Look Again, which is published from Street Noise. It is a substantial book um, and a book that, again, reinvents this. If we're talking about subgenres, I'm not quite sure that each of you is a subgenre in that sense. But we're talking about the fact that memoir as a form is very flexible and, and fluid, just like memory itself. And uh, that there are many ways of taking it into new directions and, and extending it beyond the, the, the conventional forms of comics. Um, that, uh, and this is what you've all been doing, in fact, right? including Eddie as well with his latest. And, with Mario Naomi, with hers. So in Look Again, um, we just, uh, I would say that, the, as it says here, fractured storytelling approach to, mem to memoir, um, memory itself is uh, under interrogation here, isn't it, really? Yes, and yes. What is interesting, interesting as well, Elizabeth, is that you come very much from, a, 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 I think, a, a, a prose writing background. You're a teacher. Correct, yes. And so this is, a, you embarking on drawing as well is part of your brave thing, saying, I'm going to make this in, with, with comics. Yeah. And as we know, in comics, in this wider, wonderful world of comics, we don't care how you draw. As long as you express, right. that's the most important thing. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. So no, but that's not saying anything against you no, drawing no, at it's all. Okay. I'm just saying that you go in with, with hopefully too much trepidation right. and feel that you're welcome to, to express yourself. So yeah, and you have a PowerPoint. This I wanted to put this quote up because I okay. love this quote. Terrific. Part of the terror is to, sorry. I need to read it properly from here. Part of the terror is to take back our own listening, to use our own voice to see our own light. And that is Hildegard of Bingen, who not perhaps the most familiar graphic novel artist you might not have heard of her, <laughs> but she was doing it. She was doing them. In many ways, she was doing them. If you look back to some of her amazing writing and, and artwork. Uh, I thought that was a wonderful quote you opened with. Thank and you. It, to me, felt it kind of echoed through the whole panel here. Yeah. And this also showing you uh, in your, your teaching mode um, and questioning, you know, what is truth? How will you know? This is kind of like at the core of... Right. You searching for your truth. So you put together this lovely um, PowerPoint, but I also love this panel, which, by the way, have you noticed in the lobby here, you ha we have comics on the wall in this, ho in this hotel. Have you noticed this? I'm sure you have. Those like 3D paintings. Those things? weird kind of warpy kind of panels that are the, that are decor of some but some sort. They're two giant pages of comics that are kind of dissolving, not unlike that. Mm. And then around the corner, there's a little artwork on the wall with these, these little squares of metal, the overlapping mm -hmm. squares. I think oh, that, that's a comic as well, isn't it? Is it not? I mean, I see them everywhere, of course. Yeah. The carpet. <laughs> oh my God, the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> no, but anyway. Um, but this was a lovely phrase here, which again I can't read because it's so blurry. But anyway, this is why. Sorry. Let me just do this. This is why comics have such a unique ability to express trauma. Thank you. 
both exist in fragments with big gaps. Time shifts and slides across these gaps, the usual markers of logic and narrative time. Narrative time, I'm sorry, I can't quite read that. Unbuckle, perfect phrase, unbuckle from memory, wow. Unbuckling from memory, wow. So there you go, now we go to your PowerPoint, uh, back to that, but I thought, oh, this is one I thought was wonderful. Because what you also, what Elizabeth does here is she'll invent these little avatars or, uh, or uh, symbols, if you like, that, uh, that she can bring into, this is, her, this is her brain struggling to make sense of memory. Um, so there we go, here we go, facing fragments. So. The, Tell us about the, this, the springboard for this, this incident, which you then end up retelling several, in several variations. So I had just decided I was going to learn comics. Um, I was a creative writing professor for, at this point, about 22 years. And I had published several novels, mystery novels. I have a Lambda Literary Award. So I was pretty you know, decent in prose. And I was switching to comics. What, and, what, what was the trigger point for saying, I must I'm, well, I'm I've switch always to comics? Loved, I've always loved comics. Were there and, particular authors that you liked? OK, so the Lunch Lady series by Jarrett Kozaska, I thought, that's what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I want to write fun middle grade adventure stories. That was my plan. Ah. And so I'm like, I'm going to take comic classes and go for it. And this is not quite I what it came up with, yeah, is it? Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so literally, I had started, I took my first class online to, to try to learn comics. And two months later, I was journaling or drawing as one does in one sketchbook. And truly, honestly, without re realizing what my pencil was doing, I drew the picture on the left. It's dated in, I think, sometime in June of 2017, which was uh, the dead body I found while I was walking my dogs in the woods. And that is an event that happened in the late 1990s. And I had uh, told the story many times, especially to my nonfiction students, because of talking about, OK, now how do you deal with something like this? Um, you can sort of see the, the situation was that um, I, I, he was only about six inches from the ground. Mm. Um, there was this arc of. Um, what do I say, uh, fast food leftover. Um, I had been there the evening before. I knew he had not been there the evening before. And I was utterly convinced, for whatever reason, I had interrupted a murder. And so I was terrified, absolutely terrified, that I was going to be caught up in whatever was happening. So however, I drew that. And I looked at it, which is kind of explaining there on the right. And I gasped. And I sort of closed the notebook and put it away. So then I'm working on comics, working on comics, and I thought, OK, on my way to writing the happy um, middle grade adventure story that I am going to write <laughs> in the vein of the lunch lady, I'm just going to practice with this. <laughs> because I, <laughs> that was my plan, right? A side project. Uh, sure, yes. that's right, side project. <laughs> I've been telling the story for 20 years, you know, using mm -hmm. it in my teaching and so forth. I know the story cold. I had published an essay about this story. Oh. So I already know it. I don't have to worry about narrative structure or characterization. I'm just going to learn comics, right? So I uh, started working on it and very quickly discovered, as I drew, memory that I had forgotten showed up. Mm -hmm. And as it showed up, I started to realize I had remembered it at one point and had told that part of the story, and then it had disappeared from my narrative of what had happened. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget the mind-blowing moment that I realized there were, I thought at the time, four, there wound up being six, distinct ways I had told the story. Uh, and not because I was lying in the telling, but because bits and pieces dropped away, and new pieces would show up. And then they would drop away, and something entirely new would show up. And I had no concept, none, that that had happened mm -hmm. until I started drawing it and stuff started showing up. And then what you see here was a later conceptualization in the creative process, which was I was going to do these six variations, just recursively introduce you to the ways I told the story. But I wanted the reader to experience the trauma without those subsequent filters. So I sat down and did to look like a sort of a lino cut, mm, right? Mm. Um, or scratch board, mm -hmm. this 42 pages that are fundamentally wordless. You see words there, but that's uh, representing my internal. Mm. Um, wordless snatches of memory of what I remember to the best of my ability about what actually happened that day without inter 
any like interfering narrative, mm -hmm. um, then that launches you into, here's what I think happened, now here's how I talked about it. So there are these six variations, and those are chronologically arranged, because that was the best at, way I could. At the time, Elizabeth, Beth, did you, did you, had you made some sort of diary? Had, had, had you Never wrote you a word about it right. so for nothing. years. Right. And in fact, it taught, one of the things I talk about in the book is I'm pretty uh, avid journaler. And I can go back and find mm. them right up to the day, mm. and then nothing for four months. Mm. I shut down. No. I didn't write anything about yeah. anything. And no. then when I started writing, it was like, and today I bought, you know, yeah. cat litter <laughs> at the grocery <laughs> store, <laughs> and all is well. And not a word ever until I wrote the essay about it, which was not quite ten years later. And, how, and what was the essay like? Um, uh, for, for you. What I didn't know in the moment was that I was writing sort of the current version. When I wrote oh. the essay, I thought it was real. Like, mm. I thought it was the truth, the right. factual truth. So this is variation number one we're talking about? Uh, it's four. It's number four. Number actually. four was the yeah. one that was it's your essay. essay. Yeah. I see. Right, right. Yeah. Number one is the version I told the police officer. Yeah. Number two is the version I told my parents six hours later, which was already being filtered, mm. right? Mm. Number three was the version I told, I can't remember, uh, my students for 10 or so years. Number four was the first time I wrote it in prose. Number five is what happened as a result of my talking about that. So just quickly, I'm writing this essay about this event in prose, telling some friends of mine about it over dinner, and one of my friends says, oh, I can't wait to see how you write about me. And I said, you're not in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was about that day. And she said, well, yeah, you came to my office, remember? Oh, and I said, what? Mm -hmm. And she then laid out for me, you went home, you... Uh, were there for a while, you got in your car, you drove across town, you came to my office building. Um, this is on a college campus. My daughter, uh, not mine, her daughter, who was a student at the time, saw you on campus in your mm. crappy dog walking clothes, said, mm -hmm. hey Beth, how are you? You said, mm, I just found a dead body. She said, oh, I'm gonna take you to my mom's office. She brought you to the office, I took you out to lunch, oh I sent you home, you told me the whole story, and I'm like, oh my God. Mm -hmm because I had none of that, yeah. nothing. Mm -hmm. And I freaked out. <laughs> and that's part of the book, because mm -hmm. I had no idea I had had a blackout. Mm -hmm. Worse, I like it's, it's like you know when your parents tell you a story about when you were a baby and you don't remember any of it, because mm -hmm. you have no memory. Oh, I had a very clear memory that I had gone home that day, sat down at my dining table, and didn't move for seven hours. Mm -hmm. Turns out I actually did a lot that afternoon. I drove around town, for God's sake, which still scares me. Thank God I didn't hit anybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I had nothing. To this day, I have no memory of that. Wow. But we called her daughter. I'm like, mm. the doctor told, or the daughter <laughs> told me the whole story. It mm -hmm. concurred. Have you got any, any photographic evidence, any proof? Yeah, I mean, no. But no, okay. I think I actually did fundamentally later recover one tactile memory. I can remember sitting in her wicker chair in her yeah. office and touching the armrest. That's the only thing that I actually have as yeah, a memory. It's like an emotional wicker. concussion. Yeah, yeah. And I, I've subsequently learned that post-trauma, yeah. those kind of blackouts can occur and it's but, a sort of protective but, thing for, yeah. the, for your... For and your, as for a professor, yeah. right, somebody who, who's dealing in truth with teaching memoir and nonfiction, mm. that's why this sort of what is truth and how will you know. Mm. I would have put my hand on a Bible and sworn mm. I sat at my table all afternoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I were, had were, no idea. Were you, were you brought in... I don't, you, there were obviously an investigation of this, what, how this body was... What, if it was a suicide or if it was a murder or whatever. Mm -hmm. there was, were you ever having... Were you ever, there was no trial or... Uh, no. What do you have, autopsy kind, whatever they call them. Uh, I, I don't even know if they did an autopsy. No, the police no. officer who mm. uh, came, I walked in these woods. This is a public park uh, mm. every day with my dogs. And I, I kind of remember the last thing I said to him was, please, I have to know. Mm. If this is a murder, I come here every day alone mm. with mm. my dogs. But I have to know. And he said, I will call you. And mm. he did. Yeah. Uh, and told me that subsequently they had found out that this was someone who had a history of mental health issues. And he had oh, killed yeah. himself. Mm. And they were quite sure of it. There was a, the, the drawing, the very first drawing, is very raw and, 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 and quite frankly terrifying. Mm -hmm. And also it looks to me like, almost like he's crucified. Well, that was exactly what I thought. Yeah. I mean, in the moment, he looked crucified because mm. his arms were up, yeah. right, and his leg is up. And yeah. he also uh, looked to me as if he'd been lynched. Oh. And this was in 1996. It's just a couple weeks after the first presidential election in this country that had mm. nationally politicized gay hate, basically. Right. And uh, I was not out to myself at this time, but I was absorbing all the danger in the vicinity around me. And 
my absolute first thought, which I know now was projection, et cetera, was that he had been lynched because he was gay, which by the way, he was not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know who he is now, and or, then I found out. But that was my first thought mm -hmm. when I saw that, which of course was all about me and my own terrors about the right. world and safety. Yeah. Right, of course, you would have made a, made a yeah. parallel in that and seeing yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And none of that, of course, did I recognize until I started drawing stuff. Because when I drew that picture, it was the first time the image, trauma, you're right, somebody talked about this yesterday, that we carry our trauma inside of us, mm. and when we draw it, it comes, out, it comes out of us. And there's a physical shift, at least there was for me, mm. in being able to go, there, there it is. And then I could say, look, there, that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And that was a completely different experience of communication than telling you what had happened mm -hmm. to me. Somehow the sharing of that image mm -hmm. relieved me of the sole burden of carrying that trauma. I'm wondering Just about wondering that about, in your yeah, story as well. Do you um, want to speak to that? I, I, yeah, yeah, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I just sort of wonder if that, if you feel like a relief mm. of, in some way of like getting that out of your head. I'm actually so uh, jealous. I wish that there was some kind of catharsis for me. Mm. Mm. Uh, I, I think in visualizing it, it there's like a, it's complicated, but I think that um, seeing it is it makes it so much worse. Okay. Yeah, I think drawing my abusers is like very painful. Um, but something interesting does happen, uh, and I'm sure fellow survivors of any sort of trauma can relate to this. But I, I gaslight myself like oh. constantly. Yes. And having made work about it, yeah. it's like evidence. Right. And so it pulls me out of this like self gaslighting place, which sometimes it's like really nice to gaslight because it's like. It happened to me. Like I'm so healthy, but I have this work that is evidence, and I believe myself. Mm -hmm. I know it happened because I made work about it, and there's my proof. Yeah. So that's in some ways that is how it is helpful to me. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, I was not directly victimized, which is uh, I think a big difference. That's some serious trauma, about. though. Yeah. Well, it scared me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I th yeah. I've just been given a 10 minute time. signal oh. here, so I'm terrible. Oh, no. so with, with, oh, no. well, we can, we've got the whole afternoon, haven't we? Really? I know we haven't. I know we haven't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, so, would you like to wrap up, um, give us some last comments, and we'll, we'll come back, of course, if we can, but with some QA. But this uh, is the, uh, some, sure, I guess as we the, address your PowerPoint here. I think one of the most interesting things that I experienced, and I would say to anybody, if you're mm. thinking about making graphic memoir, Trauma about traumatic things or not is to kind of uh, love yourself heavily through the process in terms of uh, how memory works and what your responsibility is to fact versus truth. I mean, you don't want to lie, but things shift and slide around you. That's my living room with no, one of slogan. my first drafts all printed out on the floor. Um, you got to have the floor space. Sort of trying to figure out <laughs> what this, yeah, right. So yeah. just that would be sort of my last thing to say. It's. Uh, I also found myself in bed curled up some days when I was working on this thing or with my mm. head on the desk crying. Mm. But in the end, I would also say that my experience has been, and of course you never know, in 10 years ask me, maybe there'll be a new version, but my, my um, experience now has seven, been, yeah. yeah, that this is the first time I've ever felt like, oh, okay, I'm done with that now. That, so I feel like it was deeply, uh, integrating or synthesizing for me. Yeah, yeah. tremendous. And, Thank you. and as you said, this is something that comics can really, really do. I mean, you could probably have done this perhaps in a text only form, but one imagines, yeah. but it really does come across so powerfully here. Brilliant. Thank you, Thank you so much, Thank Beth. You. Thank you. Thank you. So I think I need to just get through to some images now for Mari Naomi. Here we go. Um, this is just, well, I have to cut this a bit short. I'm so sorry that with, there's not, you've had another session, I know, earlier with, with Rob Kirby yesterday. I'm sorry, but, but I would love to talk to you for much longer. And if it's down to me, I would just, would just you know, lock the doors, basically. <laughs> but, uh, sorry. But yeah, but this is, I mean, this is some, some, some amazing stuff here, folks, don't you think? And uh, we're lucky to have the, the here. And Eddie, don't worry, we will get, we're definitely going to get to you. You're not on last, you're top of the bill. <laughs> you know, the, the grand finale. We're opening for you. But no, maybe right. just briefly, I mean, for Eddie, you and I, we know we were there when you were developing your autobiography comics in the early eight, uh, 80s uh, with, with um, Alec. And at the time, there'd been Harvey P. Carr, of course, before with American Splendor. But how do you f feel about the, the, the way that the memoir has, has blossomed in so many diverse ways, ways we perhaps couldn't even have imagined? Oh, I. I I don't know what to think about it. It's uh, you're doing your own work itself, of course. Um, it, at, at the, 
at the time, the, the only comics were superhero comics. Yeah. And I, I, I thought, what's, what's the, the opposite of, of, of this, these preposterous, because they're all the same. Every, every superhero is the same. In the end, he's got to fight a, a version of himself. You know, in the, the Black Panther movie, when, when she gave him a choice of the two suits, I thought, ah, somebody's going to end up in the other one. There'll be <laughs> two mean? Black Panthers. So yeah. it, it's just all these stupid cliches. I thought, I'll do, so, I'll do, I'll do the complete opposite. What's the, what's the stupidest thing I can think of? That's the, I thought, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes, yeah. But, but now, yeah, now it's... Uh, well, as a genre, as you say, it's uh, now we've got subgenres of the well, genre. Well, yeah, we're, we're not just a genre; we have subgenres. Mm. Come on, it's so yeah. big, yeah. To con- uh, were you aware to of contain the whole thing? We should just, just touch. I'll come back to you as one more, but you know, but uh, Justin Green, were you aware of Binky Brown? No, I wasn't. You weren't. That wasn't. I wasn't even aware of Harvey Pico. Oh, really? Time. Okay, you've you got there your, in your own way. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Thank you. Well, we'll come back. Now, turning Japanese, I'm only showing this very briefly because it has a new edition out, um, also to show that, yes, you do do comics, proper, so-called proper comics. But as I think <laughs> I mentioned to you, maybe when we first met, I said, I'm actually really interested in what I, I call sort of comics, where it's a lot of those things, where, is it comics? Well, it's sort of comics, um, but where they're not just doing the comics format all the time. And so with your new book, you've really... Uh, taken the, the, the form and, uh, and exploded it and included collage. Tell me also briefly, you're using a, a different, some kind of digital thing, which I'm not very aware of. Tell me about how that maybe yeah. helped, helped you with this new approach. So for the first nine books I did, um, I did it all by hand. Um, for, well, for the most part, um, not not with, with like pen and paper or pencil. Um, mm. And this is my ninth book, and I decided to go uh, in a different direction. I'd been practicing um, using the iPad and Apple Pencil um, for my diary comics on Patreon for mm-hmm. a while, and this was kind of the result of it, which it's, it's a combination of both um, collage and just traditional comics on paper and, and digital comics and, and all sorts of things. But I've always enjoyed collage. It was just not very accessible um, before the iPad came along. Right. And um, I, I, hate, I resisted digital comics. I didn't even like putting my comics online. Mm. But then once I got the Apple, pencil it just feels really good like it, mm-hmm. it, it kind of made me fall in love with art again in a, a comic specifically again in that wow I could do all these things and when I use color it looks the same on the page as it does um, on the iPad so pretty happy with that but especially the collage like I'm able to take photos and you know scale them and make them do all sorts of things um, I just I the 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 book is about friendship, and it was very difficult emotionally to write about. It was about a friendship that went wrong. But, um, but even though I was writing about a very difficult subject, the art was so much fun to make that it kind of balanced all the other stuff. Um, but that's, these, that's an actual water painting, and then I also included digital art. And, and these, these floral themes that you use, uh, can you explain something about that? They're all metaphors. Um, yes. That green you see is, uh, I, I looked it up later, it's licorice plant. Um, that represented my friend, Jody. Um, the flower, the roses specifically represented my faith in Jody. So when it's out of me, um, I'm just out of, it's just out of reach. When it's in me, I, I, and sometimes it's gone. And yes. then that's when I don't have any faith in her. There's, I mean, every single image like this that I'm wearing represents memory. Um, because, well, my book is mostly about memory too. Mm. And every time this this pattern comes on up. I'm either like I'm starting to remember things because I forgot a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And then you have, of course, the real people in your life, yeah. uh, in the same way you have with your parents, and, and uh, that the the questions of how much you include. I know that, but also you have the resources where you're able to annotate your diary entries with reactions. That I remember nothing about this. So you yeah. go back and find things that you've had gaps, rather like Beth's had too. Absolutely, there are yeah. entire people who got obliterated when I decided my brain decided to forget the friend that treated me badly, and suddenly all these people went with her apparently I had no control over that no no and it's a compelling story because of of the the the, the questioning about betrayal uh, Mm. and which is uh, and your pain from that I Um, mean I you know I was complicit too and there's a lot of it was 
figuring out how much, you know, were we friends? How good of friends were we? Um, mm. How much did I play a part in this? Like, was I a bad friend? Was she a bad friend? Like, were we mm. all just messed up? Like, I mean, yes, 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 all of it. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I, as a very, my life seems incredibly simple compared to your life, I have to say. That. Is that I mean, right? I mean, not, not to say, I mean, I'm just talking about, I'm not talking about other things, but particularly in terms of relationships and the life you've lived. I mean, you've lived quite a complicated life already and relationships. All before are, age 20, honestly. Just, I'm 50 now and it. I'm so boring. I'm, 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 I'm very boring, <laughs> embarrassing. I, there's nothing to, to put into my memoir. I but, just uh, make collage and pet cats now. <laughs> 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 but without giving anything away, but it really does pull you in. It's quite a substantial book. Uh, I forget, it's, it's several hundred pages, isn't it? It's and, a few hundred And pages. it's quite a small format, so you're able to use the, the spreads. Can, can get, there's a lot of moments you can surprise the reader and pull them through. That was a coincidental. An, an intimate kind of diary like, size in a way, isn't like it? Like, I got through half the book not, I mean, I, I started the book not knowing what was going to happen in the book, how it was going to end. I was hoping for a catharsis and to forgive my friend. Um, I did not, I don't think Autobio is ever cathartic. Um. Just, just, <laughs> Justin Green said just the same thing, See, actually. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's it like reopening help. old wounds. You're re-wounding yourself. Yeah. Um, but it could also be very fun to read. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I do. What I, I I I peeked at your um, at your book uh, and you used a lot. Of, is that the one that we're going to be looking at? We will with now. All the photographs. Just three minutes. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Well, have, I'm sorry. We, I've got more images here. Than, but this is just a backdrop because I used to, I was publishing his oh. stuff back in the eighties in graphic I, novel form. I hadn't. But um, here we go. This is the, this is the, like the beginnings of Alec. I hadn't drawn a, an autobiographical book. Over ten years, ten years ago. Yeah, ten years ago. But I thought the, I felt that the, the, the whole COVID experience. Yes. Was something worth talking about. It was this Let's great shared it. experience. I thought I would do a book about our COVID year. If I'd known it was going to go on for, what, what, are, we, are we in the fourth year now? <laughs> it's still coming I, back. I thought yes. it would all be in the rear mirror by now. Yeah. But when it started, we, we were all wearing flamboyant masks that expressed our personalities. <laughs> now, now we're just happy to I'm take the blue one they hand out at the door. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've completely lost interest in the whole COVID thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. So, um, so I have ca I have characters. They're all wearing masks that I designed for them. Right. Aww. Move on. Let's get let's get to the new the, book. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are some pages where it's just masks talking to. to that, that's me and uh, Audrey, my wife. I've got married since my previous book. I didn't explain all that. I thought I'll, I'll, I'll leave that as a mystery. Yeah, people can back that out. But yeah, oh, that's yeah. a page. This is a page I'm talking about. My, with, with all the masks and everything, and, and people growing their hair long, and my wife is convinced that uh, her husband is, a, is an imposter, yeah. and she's gone to well, see. How would you know? Yeah, yeah. She's gone He's to see a, a private detective, <laughs> and of course, I'm showing her this as I'm doing, it, and she's, I, I would never do a thing like that. Why would I care if you're an imposter? You know? I'm, I'm, I'm not invested in Clan Campbell. You know, I'm, I'm happy with this, the one I've got. Uh, but anyway, so. Because it is actually her, I, 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 would, I had the, the challenge of, of capturing her likeness with just a couple, of, with the eyes, uh, the whole of, with the whole of the lower face missing. Mm -hmm. um, the, whole, the whole experience of life is, is different. Um, you can't yeah. read people's lips. Mm -hmm. You have to this, read people's eyes. This morning, yeah. I, I'm signing for a book, you know, and the guy said, I said, what, what, what's your name? And he said, Gareth. I, is it Gareth? He said, no, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. so th this, is why, this is why we're all getting irritable and we're out in the streets shouting at each other. There's, there's a whole car chase in this book which, which came about because uh, a, a, a Karen was abusing our taxi driver and it, it, it ended up in this terrifying, <laughs> this terrifying, in Chicago, this terrifying... Uh, Car chase. I've never drawn a car chase before. This is the first time I've ever drawn a car chase. Right, right. Your, your Mission Impossible uh, era, of Mission Impossible <laughs> references. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, and you've got a, this this boomer character, this uh, kind of oh, Asian Royal, character. Oh, Royler Boom is this uh, his fictional detective who's trying to sort mm -hmm. out the muddle of the uh, uh, the imposter, the imposter Eddie Campbell. Uh, I've become very free with the idea of of it being. Um, uh, Autobiographical, mm. because I, I, all of this is all of this is completely made up. Of, but <laughs> I, I think that the, the, we have an inner life that is just as realistic. Mm -hmm. Because yes. you, 
usually when I'm standing talking to someone, I've got something else going on in my head. I was, I was held up at the airport um, recently when, when I went into England, and they were saying to me, have you come here to work? And, and, and I'm thinking, I'm working while I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm working while I'm talking to you. There's a, par- there's a part of my brain that's working on a story, you know? <laughs> it's going churning over. And, and at any given moment, I'm working on stuff. And when I'm standing talking to people, I have a terrible time paying attention to anything. I have noticed this. Have you? <laughs> I, <laughs> I yes, bump into things because you're working. Street. I mean, this is the, these, the, these, these wonderful other authors here are kind of looking back at stuff largely. Yeah. You're in the immediate moment. The immediate moment is also possibly going to be in a comic. In fact, oh, he last told night's conversation. Convers- he told a very funny story about I know, his shirt I know, do, He didn't realise it was funny. He's not a comedian. But, but we went back to the bar and tried to remember. Remember it. We've actually written down the story of your shirt, me and Landis, oh, okay, okay, as cool. best we could remember it. It was hilarious. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let me just get to the end of the images here. This is some some last oh, again, is, just just like basically all of you in many ways playing this, with the different formats is, of the comics. This you're is using my anecdote. That. This is an actual dream I had about. A dream. I'll just, I'll, well, I'm jumping in on you there, but Please. we're running out of time. But, <laughs> but, yeah. it, it's my my anecdote about uh, Chris Ware. I dreamt. Yes. That we'd, I hadn't actually visited Chris. I've had friends with Chris, but I hadn't actually visited him at his house at this time. But I dreamt that I visited him at his house, and he's showing me this book to sign to him. And I've invented a fictional cartoonist, but the great cartoonist Wahuli. Wahuli. To, to Chris Ware, you were an influence to me. And, and I said, This is amazing that you've got this. Yeah. And Chris said, Oh, yes, it's a keeper. And I thought to myself, Did he say I can keep it? <laughs> <laughs> It's these damn masks, isn't and, it? And, yes. uh, and so, so he's given me, I've got the book, and he thought, well, yeah, a, book, a book inscribed to, to Chris Ware's no good to me. I'll change that. You know, I'll change it to Eddie Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then I thought, I don't really like Wahuli. I thought, I'll just tear out the dedication. <laughs> oh. I pulled it up and put it in my pocket and threw the rest in the bin. Right. And, then, and then we left. And at the end there, there's poor Chris Ware looking at his destroyed book. Right. And, uh, and, and I'm waking up suddenly going, gasp. <gasps> what have I done? At the horror of having done this terrible thing to Chris Ware. <laughs> so this it really was all is, a dream. This is really a whole other subgenre of memoir. So, uh, yeah. so, so, I mean, dreams, you know, things that we dream are, are worth... Huge communicating and being told. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. Our dreams are as real uh, as the things we say and do in real life. Yeah, yeah. What, you want me to cut my throat? We're out of time, We're out of time now here, folks. I'm very sorry we haven't got time for Q&A, so thank you very much to <laughs> Marie Naomi, <laughs> Beth Tremblay, Eddie Campbell, and Kayla E. and Paul Gravett. And hopefully we can do this again and do discover their books. They are all absolutely amazing and will be, be so thrilling for you to, to, to discover. Thank you very much for coming.